This past weekend, the PSO would have played its final concert of the season. It was to feature a work which is very, very close to my heart. It's a piece which is all about nature, all about the forest. It is the great symphony number no. four, The Romantic, by Anton Bruckner. Anton Bruckner, in the second half of the 19th century, was seen as Austria's greatest organist. He had toured throughout Europe. Uh, he was also a composer universally recognized of great choral music, mainly sacred choral music. And it, he really started writing symphonies fairly late in life. He was in his 50s, which is late for a composer. But by the time he died in the year 1896, he had written nine numbered ones. There were other ones that were not numbered as well. These are seen, many of them, to be some of the greatest utterances in the genre of all time. Uh, Bruckner was a famously insecure person. He came from a small town in Upper Austria, and he was, uh, he was educated at the, at the Monastery of St. Florian. And when he came to Vienna later in his life, he still had this Upper Austrian accent, which they thought was rather humorous. He also wore country clothes, uh, and he was awkward in, in his way of walking around. He also had the tendency to fall in love with younger, much, much younger women very easily. They all rejected him, and so that was another reason why people tended to snicker at him behind his back. Um... On the advice of others, Bruckner often revised his symphonies, and he, as I mentioned, he was insecure. He was always looking for people's opinions, what could be better. And the Fourth Symphony is no exception to this. The first version comes from the year 1874. The one that usually is performed, but not always, comes from 1878 to 1880. It's in four movements, uh, and it was premiered finally, this version, and in general, in 1881, and this was a game-changer for Bruckner's career as a symphonist. It was premiered by the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, and it was conducted one of the, by one of the greatest conductors of the day, Hans Richter. Uh, there is a wonderful story that during one of the rehearsals, Bruckner was so happy with the way it went that he decided he, he had a gold coin, a, floor, a, a gilder or something, and he went up to Hans Richter at the end of the rehearsal and, and said, take this um, as a tip to go out and have a beer. Uh, Hans Richter kept that coin to the end of his life um, in, in honor of Bruckner. But Bruckner, um, he, this was a huge success with the audience, the symphony, and with the musicians alike. Maybe not so much with the critics, but this meant that Bruckner was now seen as being one of the greatest symphonists of the day. At the same time, we had Brahms writing his symphonies, and shortly after this, um, this is, like I said, 1881, well, within 10 years, Gustav Mahler was going to be, be beginning to write his own great symphonies. Bruckner's symphonic style isn't like anything else. It it's, has elements of long melodies like Schubert. The harmonies are, are influenced by Wagner, particularly operas like Lohengrin and Tannhäuser. And there's the element of church modes, church music. All of this combines to be something that has great spirituality. The first time I ever heard Bruckner would have been when I was 18 years old, and it was because I was participating in, in a read-through master class, and it just changed my life. I was dumbfounded, and it, this music is something that I immediately be, fell desperately in love with and has stayed that way all this time. The Fourth Symphony is called the Romantic, and this, does, this has nothing to do with romantic love between um, two people. It has much more to do with the, the idea that romantic, the concept, the Central European concept, having to do with forests, having to do with something that is 
um, that, that, that has the strength of nature, for example. Uh, idealized past. That's all part of it. Uh, there's a program that Bruckner wrote to the symphony that he wrote in letters to some of his friends, and, and he describes the very beginning. It, it begins very quietly. He says it happens in a medieval city, and it's the break of day, dawn, and from the ramparts of the city, of the town hall, comes the sound of a French horn, which is really the romantic instrument par excellence. It, it makes us think of forests, of something in the past as well. And this atmospheric opening, it, it's incredible, it, it, because it grows and it grows and it grows with this shimmering tremolo in the strings. And then, you know, dawn happens, and then, before you know it, it's the break of day. And the orchestra explodes with this sound as the gates burst forth, and he says, knights ride out into the world, I guess into the forests to do what knights do. And that's represented by this rhythm, which you find often in Bruckner. It's two against three. One, two, one, two, three. And it is just one of the most hair-raising beginnings to this. element is really important in this music, much more so in this symphony than in any other piece by Bruckner. And you see, for example, in the second theme of the first movement, this is what Bruckner calls the Gesangsperiode, the song-like period. Um, the theme, one of the main themes, is meant to imitate a bird which Bruckner knew well in Austria. It's called the Kohlmeise. And the song of the bird is represented this way. It, it's actually in the violins, the first violins at the beginning. element, that spiritual element in Bruckner's music, one of the ways that he uses to express this is, is using brass choirs. And he, uh, in this symphony, it's not a huge brass section that he has. He has you, the usual four horns and three trumpets and three, trum three trombones and a tuba. What he does is he gives block chords that, um, it, it's a chorale. Uh, it's it feels like a very old chorale. It feels like music that comes from before Bach. And it's his combination of Wagnerian harmonies and also church modes that gives you this feeling of awe and a feeling of oneness, a feeling of being with God. And this section here in the middle of the first movement is one of these places. Uh, it starts with the harmony. It starts in A-flat major. <laughs> And then he takes you down to E flat, which is the fifth, which is fine. And then, oh, I love this. That's F minor. And then, right? So he's already taking you from A flat major to C major in the course of four bars. And then he does the same thing again. It's the same sequence of chords. He, he starts from B flat minor. Here's the fifth. And then, so you've finished in uh, D major, uh, which is fine. And then he, he, he takes you from D major to G, which is normal. And he drops you down here. That's E flat. It's magic.
after a heartbreakingly beautiful second movement where Bruckner is depicting a young man infatuated at the window, outside the window of his lover, comes one of Bruckner's most famous movements. This is the third movement. He describes this as being a hunting scene. Uh, the group of instruments that he features here is the French horn section. It comes as no surprise because if you want to depict a hunting scene, well, what better instrument is there than the French horn? Uh, he takes his cue from Beethoven's use of the French horns way back in his Eroica Symphony No. 3 in, in the scherzo there. And he also has that feeling of impulse, that feeling of movement and excitement that Beethoven is able to, to, to get going in that symphony. Again, Bruckner's use of a two against three rhythm helps bind the symphony together. So, da, 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 one, two, one, two. The fourth movement is nothing short of colossal. It begins with this incredible buildup. It's this oscillating pattern of four notes in the violins over and over, very quiet. And you hear that sunrise theme that you heard at the beginning of the symphony in, in, the, in the orchestra, but it's turned upside down this time. It builds and it builds until you get to a point where you can't take it anymore and there's a, this explosion of sound. One of the greatest moments in this symphony is the coda to the last movement, the final couple of minutes. It contains all that's great in Bruckner. It starts from a hushed pianissimo in the strings, this oscillating one, two, three, one, two, three theme, and then the sunrise theme that we heard at the beginning of the symphony, and of course an, one more agonizingly beautiful chorale in the horns and the trombones, all leading us to those final measures. And just like blazing sunshine, it just bursts forth. Here we have that triumphant return of that dom theme that we heard at the very beginning of the symphony, which closes out this powerful work of art. Thank you for being with me.